So a few boring logistical things that I have to tell you first. Uh, if there's a fire, go out that way. Um, and if you need to go to the toilet at any, any point, just go straight out that door and uh, the toilets are straight ahead of you. Um, just to quickly gauge numbers, does anyone not recognize me? Okay, were you upstairs last week? Uh, did anyone watch the YouTube video instead? Okay, that's good. Um, so, uh, in case you didn't realize, uh, all of these sessions are being put on by the Oxford University Computer Society. I'm the president of that society. Uh, we've existed for 40 years now, which makes us one of the oldest computing-related societies in the UK. Um, so these sessions are going to run uh, every week in this lecture theatre and in lecture theatre B upstairs. Um, and if there are any changes, we will post that on Facebook beforehand. I know. Okay, great. Um, so today's sessions are already up there uh, if you want to have a look at them in advance, but don't worry if you haven't. Um, so finally, has everyone got Python installed on your computer? Has anyone not got Python installed, actually? Maybe that's a better question. Okay, you're going to go to that URL um, because uh, then you can access an online version of Python that is almost exactly the same. Um, if any of you have any problems with running Python or using that online version, grab one of these volunteers uh, so you can continue with the session. Okay, uh, so last week we ended on a guessing game. So the idea behind this game was the computer picks a random number between one and a thousand and you then have to say, uh, you then have to guess a number and it will tell you if it's too high, too low or correct. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that program before I move on? Okay, so we're just gonna have a quick look at it again. Um, and secondly, there was an, like a homework exercise to build a slightly different version of it. Did anyone do that? Okay, <laughs> that's fine. It wasn't mandatory. Um, so, okay, so just to kind of have a quick review to remind ourselves what that program was before, um, I'm going to open it up. Okay, so um, those of you that were in the other session will have seen a slightly different version of this program. Um, and it doesn't matter too much. So I explained that we have this for loop construct in Python. So the idea is that um, it starts out that n is zero because that's the lowest element of the range. And then it executes uh, everything from the top line where guess equals int input guess down to the end of this if statement. And then it goes back up to the top and increases n to one and executes the whole thing again. And it keeps doing that until n is, t n is 10, at which point it stops. So it never executes the body of the loop with 10. Um, it just goes to the very end. Uh, if you were in the other session, you will have seen a slightly different version of this program, which used something called a while loop instead. Uh, for those of you that were in that other session, is this all sounding familiar so far? Okay. So I'm just going to rewrite this program to use a while loop because we're going to be using them a lot more in today's session. So initially, we have to set n to be zero because while loops don't provide us with any of these constructs. And then what we want to do is replace this bit with while n does not equal 10. So um, usually we write the not equal symbol uh, in maths as um, a e regular equal sign with a slash through the middle of it. Uh, Python doesn't allow that symbol, so instead we have to write an exclamation mark followed by an equal sign. Um, in general, in programming languages, the exclamation mark is often used to represent not. So um, I will always just say not equals when I'm writing that. And then finally, at the bottom of uh, this loop, we have to go back out to the um, first indentation level. So this is the same indentation level that if, elif, else, and guess are all on. And we write n equals n plus 1. So I'm just going to run this program because it's not super important that you've all got it. Okay, so um, does everyone remember how to play this game? Okay, so what's the first guess that we're going to make? This is between one and a thousand. 500, yeah, okay. Okay, um, so we're going to walk through that one last time because the next thing we're going to do is rewriting this program 
so that instead we pick a number and then the computer has to go through this exact same process to guess it. So um, that algorithm, for those of you that have seen this before, is called binary search. Has anyone seen that or is familiar with the term? Okay, a few. Okay, so um, what we were doing here is that we effectively knew a minimum value that our number could possibly be and a maximum number. So on this number line, effectively, we're representing with the red arrow that lower bound and with the green arrow the upper bound. So one really important thing to notice here is on the left, that greater than or equals, that means greater than or equal to zero. So in that, you know, our number could be zero or it could be above zero. Whereas on the right hand side with the green arrow, it's less than a thousand, so it's strictly less than a thousand. So it's effectively the same as 900, less than or equal to 999. So we make our first guess and we go to 500. And that's basically that's because that's the midpoint of zero and a thousand. And then because in this case, uh, the computer's already picked a random number and um, we found out that the number was less than 500, we move the upper bound downwards. Everyone with me so far? Great. Okay, so this process continues and we keep doing this. And uh, I've, I've just zoomed in here because the arrows are going to get starting, uh, start to get closer and closer together. So this is an interesting one to note. Um, does anyone know quickly what the midpoint of 250 and 375 actually is? Yeah. So uh, for those of you at the back that didn't catch that, um, if you find the midpoint, it's 312.5. Um, we're only going to be dealing with integer arithmetic in this course. So when we do that sum of... 250 plus 375 all divided by 2, we're going to be effectively doing the kind of arithmetic that you would have first learned at school, where instead of having a decimal part of the number, you instead have, a, instead have a remainder. And we're going to be ignoring that remainder and just chucking it. So effectively, this division would normally be 312 remainder 1. We're ignoring the remainder 1. So this process continues, and gradually we get closer and closer together. until finally we start narrowing in and we get really close. So at this point, the next number that it's going to pick is um, 333. And then we get closer. So now we've only got two possibilities left. And that's because we can have 333, 334, but we can't have 335 because it's got to be less than <coughs> 335. So then finally, we guess 334. And we get the information back that it's less than 334. So there's only one possible value left, that this, uh, one possible integer value left, that's a whole number. Um, and that's 333. So this process takes 10 guesses from 1,000, which we discussed last week. Is there anyone that's not sure why we have to do 10 guesses to get it down from 1,000? OK. Um, so we're now going to move on to actually implementing this program. Uh, so one thing I was conscious that I was doing last week, um, and we got some feedback on this, I was kind of just deleting the code that I'd written previously and like wrote, moved on to the next exercise. And apparently a few of you were then kind of confused, like, should you delete the code as well? Should I leave it in and keep the previous program in there? My best advice is just create a new file every single time um, because then you can save all your previous work and go back to it. It's not too much of a big deal if you do lose your code, though, because it's all on that GitHub URL that I flashed up at the beginning. So I'm just going to create, create a new file. Um, so what we're going to be doing in this program is making a guess and then just asking the user if their number is less than that guess. That's all the information we need. All they're going to type back is yes or no. Um, so we're going to start out, and we're just going to create a variable that represents that arrow that we had on the left. So this is the variable for the number is greater than or equal to this guesstimate. So I'm going to call this number is. So I'm going to use slightly long names for this one, uh, just to be really clear. If it's easy for you to type, just shorten those to G and L or something, um, because it really doesn't matter what the names are. Uh, programs are exactly the same if you just go and rename the variables in your consistent.
As I explained earlier, what a while loop does is it checks this condition that I've written here. And if the condition is true, then it's going to execute this stuff. Um, now, I've in just introduced another new thing here. So in Python, we can write code, and we've seen how we can write text if we put it in quotation marks. We've seen that we can write numbers, um, arithmetic operations, whatever. But often, it's useful to just write a comment or kind of like a note to the side. And the way that you can do that is just preface uh, the line with the hash symbol. Um, Python will just ignore the line completely. So again, if you just want to test a piece of code without a single line in it, rather than deleting the line, you can write a hash symbol. Um, so the condition that we've got here is that the lower number plus 1 is not equal to our higher bound. So you remember on the slides I showed you that we could terminate when we knew there was only one possible value left. So in that case, it was we knew that it was greater than or equal to 333 and less than 334. Well, this is exactly the same condition. So this is, um, in this case, it would have been 333 plus 1 is not equal to 334. So when that condition is then false, we terminate the whole program. And that's when we've done, done guessing. So now we're going to make the guess. And we have to do it in this while loop so that um, we do it every time. And again, the guess is just finding the midpoint of these two numbers. And um, this is another weird novelty of Python. So if you've used stuff like Excel before, or pretty much any calculator on a computer, you'll know that division is usually just one forward slash. Um, and a few minutes ago, I, I mentioned that we are having to do integer division here, because we're, using, we're, we're guessing integers rather than um, numbers with a, a fractional part. And in Python, the way we write integer division is with two slashes. In most programming languages, the default is to do one slash. So has anyone seen C before? OK. Um, so C uses one slash for integer division. And one slash for re regular division as well. But we're not going to go into that. Um, so the next thing we want to do is show this guess to the user so that they can give us some feedback. So we also want to get what the user typed in back. And uh, hopefully from last week, you'll remember the input function. but the input function returns a piece of text. So we have to then use the int function to convert the text into an integer so we can actually do some comparisons with it. Um, actually, sorry. No, we don't need to do that, don't worry. Um, we are just getting a text response in this case. So the question we're asking is, is your number less than? So we're going to show them the number. and. We have to convert the guess, which is an integer, into a string, so, which is a piece of text, in order to add it onto the end of the string that we've got on the left. Is everyone clear so far? OK, um, okay so then the user is going to type in yes or no. So, so if their response is yes, that means that our guess was too high. So we can move that upper bound down. So that upper bound is number is less than. Uh, that corresponded to the arrow on the right on the slides that I showed you earlier. OK, um, so again, in the case that they say no instead, then we know that our guess is not less than it. So it's either greater than or equal to the number that you're thinking of. So we move up our number is greater than or equal to guess. And then finally, at the very end of the program, we're just going to print out that we got it right. OK, so the number that is the correct answer of these two variables at the top is going to be number is greater than or equal to because it's equal to the answer. And we know that we're only going to get to the bottom when our condition is false. So that's going to be when there's a difference of 1 between the lower bound and the upper bound.
Okay, I can't hear too many keyboards, which either means you're typing very, very quietly or you're all done. Um, so let's run this. Um, so just for sake of example, I'm going to pick 333 again. So hopefully we're going to see exactly the same values that we saw on the slides. So 333 is less than 500, so I type in yes. And it's not less than 250, so I type no. And I'm going to continue doing this. So it's actually guessed the right answer in this case, 333. But 333 isn't less than 333, so I have to say no here. And it is less than 334, so I say yes. And then finally it gets the right answer. Um, so this is actually a really important algorithm in computer science. Um, because it means that if we've got some data that's all in order, we only have to answer, ask questions of very few data points to figure out where stuff is. Um, so for example, I only wrote 999 here, but say that was a million instead. If you then run, um, oh sorry, this is the wrong program. Um, if you then, if you, so if you change the upper bound to 1,000, uh, from 1,000 to a million, then your computer will only have to do 20 guesses. What we're gonna do now is do something called um, debug information. So we're going to try and figure out if this is always correct. So we're going to print some extra information to see what the computer is actually doing. So at the very top of the loop, we're going to write a print statement. And we're just going to print out those two values, so the range that the computer thinks the number is in. So again, we have to convert number is greater than or equal to to a string. Um, and then we're just do the same with number is less than. Okay, so I'm just going to use the same example that I had before. So you remember from the slides that we saw um, it was going to be uh, from 0 to 1,000, guess 500. So stick with 333. That's, um, oh sorry, that is less than 500. Um, I then go, no so you see that it's decreased the range. Okay? Um, so this is exactly what was appearing on the slides earlier. Um, Have I convinced a few more of you that this is correct yet? Okay. What we're going to do next is move on to a different exercise. And at the end, we're going to come back to binary search. And we're going to test it through with every single value between 1 and 1,000 and see if it always gets the answer right. Okay? Hopefully, at some point, all of you have studied a tiny bit of maths. And you'll all remember what a function is. Um, so. If you uh, went to school in the UK, you will almost certainly seen stuff like um, in trigonometry, you've got the sine function, the cosine function. So these are mathematical objects that take a value in and give you a value back out. And we've also seen functions in Python, right? We've seen that the print function takes in a value and outputs it to the user. We've seen that the input function takes a prompt that it shows to the user, and then it gives you back a value of what the user typed in. So we're going to look at defining our own functions now. Uh, so just to stress this, create a new file in idle, um, or what you can do is comment out whatever you had already. Um, don't get rid of the binary search stuff, though, because we will be coming back to that code later. So it'll be useful to have that around still. So in Python, the way that we define a function is with the def keyword. So this literally is just short for definition. Um, last week, you'll remember that Python really likes to shorten things that you use all the time. And defining functions is pretty important in Python. So we're going to write a function called double. And what double is going to do is take a number x and return two times x. So um, mathematically, you would have written that as something like uh, double x equals 2x. And the way that we give a result back from a function is with a keyword called return. So we literally just write 2 times x. Now, when you run this program, Python won't do anything because you haven't asked it to call double. You're never going to execute the code that is inside the double function. So that's any code that appears underneath that top line uh, that's indented. 
So we're going to have to call that double function in order to do something. So I'm just going to print out the result. So let's double 10. OK, so when I run this, hopefully it will be fairly unsurprising that it's just going to print out 20. OK, so a function can call other functions as part of its execution. So I'm just going to define a second function um, called multiply. And in maths education that you've seen so far, and indeed in most of the functions have only taken one parameter. So double only takes x. But Python functions can take any number of parameters. So we're going to take two variables. So they're going to be called x and y. And we're just going to return x times y. So then, for example, I can write something like print uh, multiply 2 times 10. So this program, meanwhile, is just going to print 20 twice. And what's quite nice about functions is it makes it much use code. So it will be the same as the multiply function, except that one of the parameters is 2. So I'm going to write um, sorry, x. OK, so when I run this, again, I get 20 out twice. So this is exactly the same as when I enter double, I then go and enter multiply uh, with x as 10 and y as 2. I return 20, because that's 2 times 10, back to double, and then that returns that back to print, which then shows it to the user. So just to be entirely clear, um, I'm going to move back to some slides, but they have pretty much the same content on um, so we start out with this piece of code. And this piece of code then has, sees that, OK, I'm calling the double function, so I need to go and evaluate that. And effectively, what it's doing is it goes to the, the code for double and says that x is going to be 10. Because when we wrote the definition of double, we said that there was a parameter called x. And then we substituted that parameter for 10. So that, that's kind of invisible to you. You don't have to worry about Python doing that. So then we go and see, OK, in, inside the double function, we're then using the multiply function. And that does 2 times 10. And then we have to go here to the actual code for the multiply. And you see that inside multiply, because we said that the first parameter was going to be 2, in multiply, x gets mapped to 2. But over in double, we still had x mapped to 10. This is effectively like a different environment that is doing the execution of multiply inside. So it then does x with 2 and y with 10 in here, and returns that. So that value goes back to double. And then that, doesn't, that function doesn't have to do anything else. So we go back to print. And that gives the value 20 back. Are there any questions about function evaluation? OK, so what we're going to do is take our binary search program and put it inside a function. So the computer is going to effectively play against itself. So it will have already picked something. And it's then going to check if, if that function is getting it right. And then we hopefully better verify that it always does the right thing for every value between 1 and 1,000. OK? So if you go back to your code that you had for the binary search program, um, so I've got mine here, we're going to make a function called um, it's called binary bin search. Um, and we don't want this program to interact with the user at all. We're not going to have, it would be painful if uh, it said, OK, you're go now going to guess you know, 335 or whatever, and then you have to go and type yes, no, whatever, that, that whole sequence. Instead, the computer is going to do the comparisons itself. So we're going to have to cheat a little bit and give the correct answer to this function. And then what we're going to do is, Select all the code that we had already and indent it. Now, hopefully on Windows, you should just have to press the tab key. Um, can somebody on Windows do that and verify that it doesn't go crazy? It's all good. Excellent. Um, it's been a while. Um, on a Mac, you press the command key um, along with the right curly bracket key. So that's the one that's near return. And it just does that. OK, so we don't need this print statement anymore. This was just some debugging information that we added to try and convince ourselves. So I'm going to comment that out. And 
we're also going to get rid of response because we aren't asking the user for input anymore. So instead, we now are just going to do the comparison ourselves. So um, we need to write here if um, our number, um, so the answer, is less than guess. So we're going to replace this bit with answer less than guess. That's exactly what we were asking the user before. You can, you can see that in the print statement in the line above. And this then effectively just becomes an else. So for those of you that started from a blank file, you don't need any of the red lines, the commented lines. Um, I'm not going to go back to this particular code. And then finally, what we're going to do is return our solution to this problem. So we think that the binary search algorithms should come back with is, is the number, the, the, the number is greater than or equal to the value. Um, OK. So now just for the sake of example, um, I'm going to print out what the computer guesses for binary search of 500. OK, so now when I run this, it comes back with 500s. It did the binary search algorithm, and the final value of number is greater than or equal to was 500. So the final value of number is less than must have been 501. So well, this is great, and I guess we could kind of go through, and, and now we don't have to type everything in, change 500 to 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, or whatever. But we've already seen a way of getting around that. So instead, what we're going to do is put a for loop above this. So Instead, that's going to pick a value, so x, um, for, or pick a variable and set that to everything from 1 to 1,000. And we're going to run the binary search function over it. So then we're just going to do for x in range um, And then, because we need to put this bit of code inside the for loop, we're going to indent it. And then finally, we have to change the parameter that we're giving to the binary search function to x. So what this code's going to do is start out with x as 1, and then run binary search on 1. And hopefully, we're going to get 1 back again, and 1. Then it will increment, so that's increase x by 1, um, to x to 2, and run the whole thing again. And in theory, we should then just see a list of numbers that's every number that's uh, greater than or equal to 1 and less than 1,000. So that's all the numbers that this program can guess. OK, so this is the part where I really have to ho hope that I've typed everything correctly, because otherwise you're all going to turn around and uh, walk out. Um, okay. Yeah, this, this looks pretty good. Um, So the output here is really pretty slow. We still haven't seen all the numbers get printed. And the reason for this isn't because our code is slow, but because idle itself isn't a particularly fast evaluation environment. And it's doing a lot more work than the 10,000 comparisons that actually have to be executed in order to run this program. So I'm going to stop that now. Um, if you've got a long running Python program like this, um, you can press Control C, and that's the same on Windows or Mac. And it will just stop the program like that. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to take out these uh, commented lines so that it's a bit easier to copy. OK. So I guess the real test actually is, have I now convinced you all that this works? Hands up. OK. Well, that was a big increase on earlier, so um, I'll take that. So I'm just going to give you a moment to copy this out and run it on your own computers. Um, and if you've got any questions, wave at the volunteers. OK, uh, so now we're going to move on to what will probably be our final program of the evening. Um, so who has heard of the Fibonacci numbers? OK, so um, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a sequence where you just add the previous two numbers together to get the next one in the sequence. So if you start out with 0 and 1, then 0 plus 1 is 1, then you have 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3. And you continue that sequence onwards. 
So we're going to look at a couple of different ways of writing that program in Python, uh, the program that generates that sequence. And it's an interesting experiment because one of the programs that we're going to write, which is going to seem hopefully like quite a simple program, is going to be painfully slow. And then we're going to write a much faster version that isn't much more complicated, but it kind of demonstrates th these principles that um, computers, sure, are very, very fast, but you still have to have a clever algorithm. So it's a bit like with binary search. We don't have to guess all a million values if we're searching over a range of a million. We only have to guess 20. So again, I'm going to create a new file. And I'm just going to write a function called fib. And what fib is going to do is give me back the nth Fibonacci number. So I'm going to give it a parameter called n as well. So the, the first two Fibonacci numbers are 0 and 1. So the, the zeroth Fibonacci number is 0, and the first Fibonacci number is 1, because we're counting from 0 in this case. So if n is 0, we're going to return 0. Then if n is 1, we're going to return 1. Otherwise, we need to add the previous two Fibonacci numbers together. And we've already kind of started doing this because we've got a function called fib that is going to give us back the nth Fibonacci number. So if I want the nth minus 1 and the nth minus 2 Fibonacci numbers, then I can use the fib function to do that. So I'm just going to write this. For those of you that have seen the mathematical definition of the Fibonacci sequence, or if you go on the Wikipedia article, it will have exact, pretty much exactly that, but written in mathematical notation rather than uh, Python. We're just going to try. So again, we're going to write a function that just prints out a few of these. So I'm going to start with, and we're starting at zero. Um, we're just going to print the first ten Fibonacci numbers. When I ran that program, um, my computer was able to print out those first 10 Fibonacci numbers pretty quickly, right? Um, the only real delays was just Python processing the text. Um, so let's up this to 20, say. That, that shouldn't be much slower, maybe just two times slower. Um, we're only working out 20 numbers instead of 10. So I'm going to run that. So that, that seemed about two times slower. Um, I mean, pretty short period of time, so nobody's counting. Uh, so let's go up to 40. It's just two times more. So maybe this will take about two times longer than the previous run. Again, like my computer's pretty fast, so I'm not expecting this to take too long. And now it's slowing down. And now it's getting really slow. And it's, it's basically stopped. But these numbers aren't that big. I'm, I'm only working out kind of the 30th Fibonacci number or something. Um, does anyone have an idea why this has suddenly got so slow with such a simple program? H hand up at the back. Yeah. So. Let's think about a really simple example. If we work out what the second, so fib of 2 is, we're going to call fib with fib of n minus 1, so fib of 1, and fib of n minus 2, so fib of 0. Now, in both of those cases, it's just going to use those first two return statements and get the back value back immediately, right? So it only works out basically, th is there, there's only been three calls to fib in total. Um, then if we work out fib of 3, we need fib of 2 plus fib of 1. But to work out fib of 2, we already said that we had to kind of do those other two calls to go and work out what fib of 1 and fib of 0 were. Is everyone with me so far? OK. So by the time you get up to fib of 40, it's going to go and work out fib of 39 and fib of 38. But it's also, in order to work out fib of 39, it's going to work out fib of 38 and fib of 37. And it's basically going to do all these computations twice for every single Fibonacci number. And that sequence balloons up really, really fast. So my computer's on, like, only just finished doing all of these. Um, and in fact, if you go up to about 100 with this program, you'll see that your computer probably isn't going to finish anytime soon. But there shouldn't be a hard problem, because we can see that we can just add the previous two numbers together to get the next Fibonacci number. 
We shouldn't have to sit around waiting for the end of the universe just to work out the hundredth Fibonacci number, say. So we're going to now write a different version of this program that maybe works a little bit more like how you'd expect it to work, and we'll see that that version is a lot more efficient. So now I'm just going to declare a new function called fib2, and just like before, it's going to take the parameter n. And we're going to have a variable called a, and another variable called b. And a is going to store the current Fibonacci number, so we start at 0, and b is going to store the next Fibonacci number. So now we're going to introduce another while loop, and in each iteration of this while loop, we're going to compute the Fibonacci number that comes after b. So to do that, we're going to introduce a new variable called c, which contains a plus b, so that's the next Fibonacci number. Once we've got that next Fibonacci number, we need to move the Fibonacci numbers down, so a will contain b and then b will contain c, but the order of doing this matters because otherwise we might lose some information. So firstly we have to do a becomes b, and then we have to do b becomes c. If we did them the other way around, uh, which you're more than welcome to try, a and b would both end up containing the same value, which we don't always want. Finally, we have to decrease n, because we're going to go from n of its original value down to zero, and that's when we terminate and return a, which is the nth Fibonacci number. Finally, we just need to update the fib call inside the for loop so that we're calling the new function. Now when we run this, we'll see that the output is actually really fast, and Python doesn't have any problem computing the first 40 Fibonacci numbers. So let's try computing the first 400 Fibonacci numbers to see if that's much slower. Again, this doesn't really seem to have much of a problem, and really the only delay here is just how slow idle is being about outputting the numbers. If you ran this in another environment, you would actually find that this is pretty much instantaneous to find all 400 first Fibonacci numbers. So this pretty much wraps up today's session. So, so far we've seen the binary search algorithm, which is really important in computer science for searching large amounts of data, functions, and recursion in Python. And next week we'll be moving on to data structures. If you want to look at any of the resources from today's session or last week's session, please remember that you can go to our GitHub repository, which contains all of the material that you've seen so far, including all of the code samples that you can just go and download. Now in these first two sessions, we've actually shown you all of the Python syntax that we're going to use in this course. So that's the, the keywords and the grammar of the Python programming language. But Next week, we're going to be moving on to looking at data structures like lists, which allow us to store more interesting data than just the strings and numbers that we've seen so far. After we've taken a look at data structures, then we're then going to look at actual problem solving and writing larger programs. So we'll start out by writing a simple stack interpreter and follow this up with a uh, machine learning experiment. Thank you once again for coming, and I look forward to seeing you again next week.